name is Joyce Linehan. I co-own with uh, Joe Panese, after our records. We put out um, his records uh, actually exclusively until this year when we did decide to put out another artist record as well. Um, I also, um, for my real uh, pay paying day job, uh, run a public relations company in Boston called Ashmont Media, which works with nonprofit arts organizations in Boston, like the Boston Book Festival, Art of Boston, Arts Emerson, a bunch of theater companies, opera companies, um, uh, festivals, and things of that nature. And I've been doing this for about uh, 25 years now. Yes, you have. And uh, there's some other info back here we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, as you said, Ashmont Records, um, Joyce actually also wrote a book, or co-wrote a book, really, of her Twitter interaction with Joe Pernice who, for those who don't know, was in the Scud Mountain Boys, and then, what was the other? Pernice Brothers. Well, Chuck Goodick. He changed Goodick's his name Skyline. in his band, which is really anything. <laughs> I don't recommend it. And um, uh, Scud Mountain Boys was on Sub Pop for many years. And, and I worked for Sub Pop. For Joyce worked for Sub Pop right in Boston. And um, so she, she co-wrote a book with her Twitter interactions with Joe, which we'll probably talk about. And uh, there's their website and her Twitter handle. And, the Prettiest Brothers. A um, little bit about me, and then we'll ask some questions about you guys. Um, I host and produce a music interview show called Well Rounded Radio. If you guys were here last year, I actually kind of did a session with Ariel um, that we're going to similar to what we did today. I'm also the director of marketing at rstage.com, which is a competition website for artists and music discovery platform. And I'm um, also working on something called Musicians for Music 2.0 Venture Fund that started a little over a year ago. Uh, this idea of uh, helping music discovery startups find funding in this uh, developing music sphere. So um, we can talk about that. Um, so a couple of questions for you guys. How many of you have seen Ariel in the past? I've met her, but I've never seen her give a presentation. Okay. I missed her presentation on that. Gotcha. And um, how many of you were here last year for this session? Okay. So some of the ground in the presentation is pretty similar. So maybe we'll go through it and just sort of walk people through it. Um, but I, before we do that, I'd love to get a sense from everybody, kind of some, some bare bones of what it was that you were hoping to get from this session. Obviously, it's about marketing and, and handling a lot of your sort of marketing and PR. But if anybody else wants to throw out some specifics that you're looking to learn, that would be really helpful. Uh, the email data management systems, uh, various ones that are Based up in Tacoma, DC. I do the book, uh, I'm sort of ad hoc doing the booking for it. I'm getting a lot of inquiries from all over the country because uh, I'm signed up with, uh, it, it, you know, it, indie, um, indie on the move, uh, dot com as, as a venue. And it's basically a ton of people that are interested in playing uh, my space. And, and it's just, it's just like I, I have very limited email access time and whatever, and just how to sort of interact with people. And just I'm terrible. I don't have a lot of time to do a lot of, of publicity in the neighborhood. And our, okay. our and unless we, we're doing local people, you know, like local high school band or something playing, we get you no know, people show up. I had a great show about ten gotcha. days ago. And well, after we go through this, actually, there's a. Um, uh, a a person up in Boston who's worked on this idea called Scalable Intimacy, which I'll do at okay. the end of this because I think it's, especially with social media, it's very time consuming and it's a question a lot of people have. Yeah, How do you do this without sitting here all day in front of your computer, which we all do already? Yeah. I'm doing too much of already. Um, other, other items that people are looking for? Yeah, independent artists, so the way they're working now. Okay, perfect, perfect. I can't hear that. Um, she said um, independent artists promoting their own work. And I have that. <laughs> and, and, she and, does. and also on the board of the Songwriters Association, in general, sort of finding out tips that we can pass along, maybe tips from this presentation in, in our sure. monthly newsletter that I can pass along. Yeah. That sounds good. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so, if you want to do that, I'll just go through this. It'll probably take like 10 minutes, and then if you have questions, just raise your hand and we'll try and answer as best we can. This is obviously Ariel's work. It's not mine. Um, I've done a fair amount of 
consulting for social media folks since it's something that a lot of companies are trying to figure out how do they utilize it. And hers is not necessarily exclusively social media, but as Joyce will attest, as somebody who's doing both traditional and social media, it's you can't really do only one or the other anymore. And I, whenever people say just do social media, I think that's a little crazy myself. So, um, so we'll just take you through here. I'll just say uh, a couple of quotes from um, a book called, from Eric Palman called Socialnomics uh, about this idea of social media basically not going away. I think a few years ago people kind of thought maybe it's a fad and it's leaving. I've had a couple of conversations with people recently who have asked me, oh, do you think Twitter is going to, you know, you know, splatter out, and I'm like, mm, no, I actually don't. It's, there's a whole infrastructure now built up underneath it, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, so I don't think that it's something that's gonna go away. Uh, the numbers are up to like 150 something million users now, so it's growing pretty fast. Uh, this is a pyramid that Ariel has about, really about sort of the, the percentage of people who sort of make the grade and make the cut in the music industry, which it's not surprising, but I think when you see it as a visual, you realize that it, you know, it, it, the odds of getting to a certain point in the business are tough. Um, but I think it's also kind of encouraging in a way because this is about the old school, which was you had to get through a lot of gatekeepers in order to even get your record out. And so the idea that there's a smaller tiers of people who can sell maybe fewer records, but actually might be able to make a living doing it. Um, so I mean, obviously. Those are pretty staggering numbers. Five million artists with my my space pages, and up to you know, one hundred and ten artists who might be selling more than two to fifty thousand. But obviously, as they say, with the long tail, there's an audience out there for lots of different things. They don't have to be mainstream interest anymore. So we asked that question. Let's get that. Um, this idea of of using social media to sort of bring your personality to life which I think there, there is a bit of that in terms of how do you, uh, how do you put yourself forward through social media with a, a little bit more of a casual um, attitude and, and approach, but obviously try to be a little more systematic about what it is that you're trying to do with your marketing, which we're going to talk about here. There's a lot of slides on that. So she's talking about MySpace and Twitter, uh, Facebook. Um, not necessarily having specific goals, uh, not using your email uh, marketing effectively, and asking for money before building building value, which I think the idea of social media, a lot of it is now kind of your currency of your, you know, what is your worth and your value in that sector, in that community. There are lots of people who are using Twitter and they'll talk about themselves, but then maybe it'll only be 10% of the time. The rest of the time they're talking about other people and kind of sharing other ideas and linking to other things. That, that idea, that mentality, I think, has become really powerful because people start to trust you more if they think that you're not just constantly promoting yourself. Uh, so this is an interesting slide from the perspective of what, what the goal is and really kind of ask yourself, what is it I'm trying to do here? Is it using these platforms simply to interact with the, the audience and your, your potential audience? Or is it about uh, trying to accomplish something specific and having that in mind as you do it? Um, as a person who has done marketing for 23, 24 years, I've always been astonished when I go into a company and try and ask people, well, what, what's the goal? What is it we're trying to do? And often the, the people on high never even quite know it. They don't verbalize it or they don't, they don't have it succinct enough. And so a lot of what you do in marketing is try to help people to focus that and say, this is what we're trying to do. Um, I think that's true for musicians too. And the onus is now on musicians and artists and filmmakers and painters and all the rest to manage their own career. And most of us are doing it or did it because we want to be creative, not necessarily because we want to be a marketer. So one of the ideas is to think that through and say, what is it we're trying to do? How, how am I communicating with you? Asking your audience what it is that they are looking for from you and really having that kind of dynamic relationship. You know, it's not kind of a one-way medium, it just inherently isn't. Uh, she talks about analytics here, which I've been learning a lot about in my, my day job and in, in finding it fascinating from the marketing perspective of knowing you know, what is it that we're doing that's working and what isn't working so that you can actually give more support to the things that do. And again, 20 years ago in marketing, you really didn't know. You, it would be anecdotal if you took out a print ad in a magazine. If somebody said that they saw the ad, you might think, oh, that was great. 
but um, by and large you would be able to track it. Whereas with the web, you can really track almost everything that someone's doing on the web, so long as you know how to manage the back end. I know we have a session coming up uh, this weekend that's going to talk about that. Uh, talking about social media, about what people did for MySpace in 2002, and they're essentially doing the same thing. I, just, I think she's kind of getting at the idea that it was kind of a bit of a one-way platform and MySpace wasn't terribly interactive. Um, how many, how many people are using social media already? How many people are using Facebook? How many people are on Twitter? How many people are using YouTube? LinkedIn? Okay. Um, I think what I was just saying to Joyce before we started was what's interesting is three or four years ago, it was more confusing because there was a lot of players out there. And I think it's actually been weeding out a lot. And you see it on TV and in print ads now that everybody's got their Facebook and Twitter icon there, which obviously it wasn't happening three or four years ago, but it's kind of fascinating that those two players have sprung ahead of the path in such a big way in YouTube. Yeah, I mean, what's, I mean, what's the force where that localized location dependent uh, social? Somebody will probably buy Foursquare yeah. and, and incorporate it again or, or kill it, depending yeah. on what they want to do. But I mean, it's interesting that Facebook, you know, MySpace never had that prominence. And I think Facebook, because it's so so uh, wide usage, and you could do so many things with it, it actually has sprung ahead. You know, they're not making movies about people that uh, are irrelevant. So, I think the idea that uh, those those two channels have really sprung ahead is interesting. And it, it, from a social media perspective, it's actually good because it's impossible to do all of these things all the time. And so, if it, the audience is kind of uh, the platforms have narrowed down, it's actually beneficial. Uh, so she talks a little bit about the social media must-haves, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Flickr, and, and uh, photo sharing, YouTube, and, and blogging. Um, I think it always depends on what it is you're trying to do as to which of these really makes the most sense, but um, we'll talk about some more specifics as when Joyce comes back up. Um, again, about having some goals. You know, is it, you're trying to sell music or you're trying to get people to share links back to your music? Is it trying to get people out to a show? Is it trying to turn people onto something for free and then converting them over to some of them to paid customers? Um, is it trying to create a network amongst all the other musicians that are either local or national, international, and use each other to help uh, spread the word and, and share about what you're doing? Um, I think there's, in all of these platforms, you can really do all of those things, but it is one of those questions that you have to ask yourself before you dive in. Um, she has this broken out as kind of a week over week plan, which is part of the book that she wrote, um, which I don't know if we have copies of here, but we might. Um, but it's this idea of um, thinking through your goals and then starting to put together your strategy and plan. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going, I was trying to, some of these I don't really know where she's going with, so I'm going to. But could we look at, could we read sure. the week one with the This is, I think, the. It says, pitch equals cutting through the noise online, giving people with pea brains a sense of what to focus on. Um, I would rephrase that <laughs> and say that what I what I actually am amazed at is how many websites you go to and they don't tell you what it is that they're there for or why would I want to spend any time with you. Um, it's astonishing, actually, how many websites don't do that. Either they don't have a really great tagline to tell you, or they don't bother to tell you. Um, in the music sphere, this is really true. Like you go to a blog and you'll just be like, what is it? It's a blog. And then you're like, well, what do you like? And like, what are you interested in? And it takes uh, too much time to figure it out. Um, I, would, I would put this as try to be blunt with people so they know what it is that they're in for or why they want to spend more time with you. Um, and look, look at the websites that you travel on a daily basis. It's astonishing how many really big brands. I mean, when you're Target, you don't have to do that, or Amazon, but there's an amazing number of brands online that are just like, you know, they, they, they're not overt about it, they're not, they're, they're sort of everyone there must assume that everybody knows what it is they're there for. So I think you have to look at it from the, the visitor perspective and try and think, why would I want to spend more time on this site? Why would I want to bother clicking on the play button? Why would I want to share this with somebody? And really do some of the work for people. Uh, 
I think this is really going to the idea of how do you make your pitch about who you are to other media, be it online or offline. Um, musicians, by and large, hate being compared to musicians of the past, but as somebody who's been on both sides of this, I know if it helps the person list, who's going to listen to it or put the CD in, make a decision about, you know, do I want to listen to this or not, then it's worth doing. Um, I do it a lot with twi tweets, Twitter, when I, somebody sends me stuff, I'll say, send, you know, for fans of this, that, and the other thing, because I figure if somebody sees that and they love Lucinda Williams, then maybe they'll want to click through and listen to this artist, whatever it might be. Um, as hard as it is to say, well, we sound like these two or three artists, um, try and make it easier for the person on the other end to know what it is that they're getting into. Um, and if, it, if it's hard to do because you have a lot of influences, ask your, your friends and your, and your audience, you know, who would you say we sound like and give us two or three artists and, and try and you know, be specific. Uh, her uh, reference here, some of it is in the film world about how when people pitch films, they will go in and say it's like, you know, the Beverly Hillbillies meets Terms of Endearment, you know, and they'll turn it in really succinctly because nobody in Hollywood has any attention span. So, the idea that you're making it really easy for people and, and really giving them an entree to get in and, and hit the play button, put the CD in the player. Um, the old days of putting, by, putting the needle down on the vinyl and the critic giving it 20 seconds to see whether or not they're going to listen to the rest. <clears throat> this idea of, of the branding, I think, is, is becoming a larger and larger issue. Kind of goes to the point we just said about for marketers. A lot of this stuff comes intuitively, but I think for musicians, they, they have maybe don't have marketing or branding um, experience. And the idea of you know, having your materials look great. Um, and I always get annoyed when people talk about this, about you know, the old, the old traditional record and music and industry and, and publicity world about you know, sort of throwing it all out with the bathwater, when in fact, what people got from a record label and from the publicists and from everyone, the managers, was consistency and really a great professional um, face. And so you got great photography, you got great album design, you got great you know, uh, titling, you got great positioning. And nowadays, a lot of that's falling on musicians' shoulders and they have to do all of it. And it's, it's not something you've done before. It, is, it can be a little uh, awkward and difficult to, to, to learn. I think what she's sort of getting at is trying to think through that branding, your own personal branding, and if it means spending some money on a photographer or a designer or a website designer to actually bring what you do up to a point where it really feels professional and people instantly when they see it, they feel like you're on your game. Um, to me, is a really big deal because they, they've done all sorts of studies about websites and that you basically get about three seconds of somebody's time before they click away. So if somebody lands on your website and it feels thrown together and haphazard and like you just did it yourself. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, I, I saw the business of hiring for musicians. I can't tell you, there's a musician. I mean, I, I see, I walk with a musician, he's such a shot, his person's amazing. And, but it's like, go to her website, it's like, contact. I tried to send her an email, you know, trying to inquire about hiring her for a gig. And it was like, oh, that went to my spam email. You know, it's like contact me at, at so and so at right, info right. or or booking at so and so, right. and it went through his spam email. They said, "Oh, try, try to contact me through my website." Well, whatever my software on my computer that I was using, the button didn't come up to, to send to right. send the the, the thing. In. You know, well, it's like if you said said that oh, website, you should have contact information. You should have Somebody on top of it. Yeah, that's true. I, and I, I think when it comes to, to web design and um, photography and uh, you know, album design, for those of us still printing CDs, I think all of those things, um, a, t a lot of thought went into it over the years and still does. And it's not something that's haphazard. And I think if someone's managing their own career, they need to have that a little bit of that same process. and. Literally every town around the country and around the world, there are photographers and designers who would help to do this stuff and not cost a fortune. But I, I've become a big advocate of don't try, don't try to do this all yourself. Just because you can put the software on your computer well, doesn't mean you're a designer. Through, through my MySpace site, like, refuse to give me. Well, that's a that's a little bit of a different issue. That's more of you're managing your own career and, and you're not actually staying on top of what somebody yeah. is is trying yeah. to do, right? Um, and, and again, but it is to the point of. 
if you're going to have a website, you need to either have somebody help you out with it and staying on top of it, because if it's not your forte, then don't try to do yeah. it necessarily. Yeah. So. Um, this is true. Uh, the MySpace numbers are huge, and it's kind of funny how they've been sort of disregarded by a lot of people. Um, I think it just goes to the point that there's only so many hours in a day, but the, the number of active users on MySpace are, is still tremendous, and it is still kind of one of the main go-to places for a band to just send someone to so they can hit play and hear music, even though MySpace is shoving these stupid ads in between the songs. The idea that um, somebody can come and it's a very easy experience to get to hear the music, so that's why people are still using it. Um, there, there's others out there though, there's um, SoundCloud and Bandcamp and there's a bunch of other platforms these days that I think are even nicer to look at. But uh, it, it's the idea that MySpace is dead is it may be uh, overstated. And what I what I found is it's, it's sort of a self fulfilling prophecy. A lot of people stop using it as a messaging system. Um, I would like to add to that. Um, I was actually pretty shocked the other day on MySpace page I'm managing for an artist. You know they've redone it, so you can see more information and the dates. They the did. Events. I'm actually able to see how many people have clicked on that show. Oh, cool. Yeah, and that's great. I'm really shocked. They've been rolling out this new interface that's much nicer to look at visually. Yeah, yeah. I was really yeah. shocked. Yeah, again, you know, when people say, it's like having on a fire on a, on a sidewalk. Right. You know, you've got to use it. Yes. Yeah. Somebody might take it and take action. That's true. But uh, I was shocked at how many people were clicking on the events. And if 10 people are clicking on the show, huh, that's interesting. on my space, I would so they're wising up a little bit. That's good. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's interesting is that they obviously made their own butter on music, whereas Facebook is still very confusing from a music standpoint. There's all kinds of applications you can push in or, or tabs to add, but they sort of have consciously not gone after that audience, and they've got deals with Pandora and you know, whoever else. But I mean, MySpace really, that's really music was where they focused originally. Yeah, I guess my point would be don't disregard your MySpace just yep. because we think it's dead. It is still kind of, it's not what we used to, but I, you know, there's a another channel, people right? People who look at one event, if yep. five of those people buy a ticket, it will come. It is true. It um, again, a little bit of, of uh, guidance around your own website and how you're using it from a branding perspective. Um, what is it that people get? What do they absorb when they get there? Do they, do they know who you are? Do they know what they're, they're in for? Do they know why they would want to click through? Um, they, in the web analytics world, it's called bounce rate of when somebody goes to a site and they never go past the front door of the homepage. And so you look at a lot of websites and uh, if a really great bounce rate is like 50%, 45%, but a lot of websites it'll be you know, 70, 80, 90%. Those are, that's basically people who hit the web main site, main page, and then left without it getting passed. They might have been on the site for 10 minutes, but they never actually moved past the front door. Um, I know you, you're do, we're doing a session about analytics, but um, Google Analytics, which is actually free to use, and for anybody who is creating their own website and doing it on any of these blogging platforms, or if they have a designer that's uh, gonna do it, you actually set up a uh, Google Analytics account through your Gmail account, and all it is is a little string of code that you put on every page on your website, and it's astonishing how much you can figure out about who's coming to your site, where they're coming from, and what are they doing when they're there. Um, you can't tell who they are demographically, um, but you can, um, I'm still learning a lot about this myself, but it's a lot of it is about you know, what's of most interest to them, where are they clicking through, how much time are they spending on, on a site or on a page, um, where are they coming from, which, to your point about MySpace, they've never, up until now, they've never shared that data. Facebook still really doesn't, Twitter doesn't. So if you want to know where people are coming from, you have to do it yourself, because these other companies are not going to make it easy for people to know where they're coming from and where they're going to. So um, I'm sure most of you have Gmail accounts at this point. It's actually insanely easy to do. Um, to just plot in some, some code. Uh, she also talks here about widgets, which I'm not sure if she gets into some of the things that some other companies are doing in terms of widgets that you can put on your site that are feeding from your presence on those other third-party sites. So you could do this on Facebook, and we're seeing it now on pretty much every site. 
of, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of this or I like this. That's basically a widget that Facebook has provided that the, that the entity can post a bit of code on their site and then it connects back to your presence on Facebook. Um, but Reverb Nation does it, we do it at our stage. Um, I don't know if Sonic Bits does it, but a lot of companies are doing it where they'll give you a widget that you can have on your site, then it helps to kind of cross pollinate the audience and where they're coming from. I don't know if MySpace is doing that yet. I haven't seen that. But Twitter has a bunch of them, obviously. You see that on sites all the time where there's a Twitter feed on somebody's site itself, and that's basically coming from a widget that you get from Twitter.com. Uh, this is a bit of a 90s question. But it's, can you send the, tell me a place where you can, with all these new sites coming, like Bandcamp, et cetera, uh, it's hard to determine which ones are going to have a staying power and which are not, and a place where you can kind of track and see where people, what sites people are visiting in terms of social media. Facebook, you know, and, and the, I know Facebook's obviously. Oh, you mean their numbers? Yeah, their numbers and, and, and what, and, you know, because I mean, you could spend all day uh, creating little pages for these uh, the different the arenas and, and yep. how, uh, how useful is that? I don't know if it's much time and effort. If something's kind of flavor of the week, yeah. that thing, or something actually has staying power with like a Facebook or a Twitter. And right. It's, it's a common kind of play. Yeah. Like independent musicians these days because uh -huh. you can spend all day um, creating them and you're not really sure how much of the audience there is. I think each of them has their own um, benefits and value to them and they're not all the same. Facebook obviously I don't think is going to go away anytime soon but uh -huh. somebody else may come along and you know, outdo them and five years from now they, they can be MySpace, who knows. I think on the musician side though there's a lot of them that like Bandcamp like SoundCloud, like Reverb Nation, that they all have different tools and, and uses, so you can't really write them all off. I mean, they all have to do different things. Yeah, I've seen Reverb Nation with, uh, with a lot of the submissions. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, the computers I use don't have a lot of capacity to, uh, to access a lot of the stuff, but it's like, I've seen a lot of stuff submissions through either Reverb Nation or Sonic Bids, um, you know, and a few through Bandcamp, but Bandcamp seems to come up in the last several months. Yeah. I guess my question is like the analytics as a whole, like to track what sites are being visited the most and most frequented. And if you've got to really be able to gauge, you know, you hear uh, MySpace is dead, et cetera, et cetera, but then we hear from, from you that, uh, you know, people are still using it and it's still viable. Is there a site or a source where I can go to? Oh, for all terms. Of the, yeah, like traffic that are going to. Do. One thing should be your only concern. I mean, uh -huh. it's the level of engagement that you can get with any particular right. site. So where Twitter, uh, Twitter might not um, get you the most traffic per se, it might have the best in-depth Engagement right. with people that you want to engage with. So I'm not sure. And traffic is a good metric, but yeah. it's not the only metric. Right, right. That doesn't answer quality, quality or quantity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, on Facebook, they have this thing, insights, which if you have, if you're the admin on a page or a group, you can see it. Mm -hmm. People discuss the, the pros and cons and the value of that. I think to Joyce's point, it's more about where do you sort of feel this sort of natural and organic buzz happening for you and for a brand. Um, there's a lot of people who are just spending their whole day on Twitter because it ends up generating so much retweets and links back to your site and meeting new people and new people following you. And there's something very dynamic about that, but it's impossible to actually qualify. Well, yeah. What did that do for me? You know. Totally. So um, Twitter. I mean, and Facebook, Facebook and Twitter are two very different experiences. You know, Facebook, you can't go out and just start trying to gather people to join your page unless you spend money with them. Whereas with Twitter, you can actively follow people who are tweeting about any subject matter. And it's time consuming, but you actually create a lot of leads and connections with people who might be interested in what you're doing. So. I have a question about widgets, um, because websites are kind of Almost like my website is full of widgets. Widgets, <laughs> and all the time. So, um, what do you think in terms of streamlining it? What do you think are the most important widgets to have? Do you have any suggestions as to how many I should cap it at? 
Um, you know, it's funny. I've been waiting for to see an artist's website that's just widgets. Is, <laughs> I mean, honestly, why, I mean, why not? You know? We came really close to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, I was doing these gatherings in Boston for a bunch of months, and I kept asking, has anybody seen examples of that? Because you, people are spending more time on these third-party sites, and so why not just have a, your website, your brand, be this intersection point? Because a lot, a lot of times what happens is somebody is a fan of Facebook, then they start following on Twitter, then they connect to you on LinkedIn, then they read your blog, you know, and it, it does have that effect. I don't really know what the you know, total number that should be. I think from a, from a volume standpoint, Facebook and Twitter have the biggest numbers, so I would make sure those are most prominent. Um, I like a lot of what uh, Reverb Nation is doing, and our stage is doing them, where they're trying to pull your audience to things that will help advance the career, and, and you're starting to see widgets of like, uh, play the whole album on someone's website through a widget, which rather than trying to host it yourself and do all that other stuff, I think is kind of clever. Um, Bandcamp was doing, you know, let you download it or listen to it for free or pay what you want, and so you can have it on the site. And I think people are using all of these different platforms, and, and it's not like one size is gonna fit all. But obviously, to the earlier point, some of these may not play out, they may not exist two years from now, they may get bought up by somebody. You know, it's kind of hard to predict, so I don't, I don't really have any guidance for that. Um, if I may just add, I think part of the whole business of the internet is that it's a She doesn't really get into the, the nimbits and top spins of the world in this, but right. for those who haven't heard, they're basically platforms that people are have developed for the artists to have accounts with them to really be kind of one-stop shopping, to do distribution, marketing, merchandising, maybe tour announcements, whatever it might be. They're, they're different platforms, but, and I think there's one other one that's, that's coming up. But the idea is to try, how do you make it easier for someone to manage their career you know, from A to Z? The first thing um, to keep in mind, we've got a lot of, because I'm um, in building and developing websites for artists, we end up using Sonic Vids, YouTube, and pulling them all together. And pretty soon they start debilitating the way the page loads, and that becomes an issue. So this, sure. there's, a, there's kind of a, you know, once you hit a limit of the number of widgets that you've got on there, it starts pulling in way too much information at the same time. So the, the best thing to do is find out what's the first thing you want someone to do. If it's a player to listen to music, have that up front and center, you know, and then you might promo with a graphic or JPEG to a YouTube channel or to something else where they can link to a separate page where it loads just that one widget. So right. prioritize, you know, set the goals that you want, but um, you have to watch the, the load times. So yeah, that's true. You had a question? I was just going to say from the fans' perspective, having run fan blogs and sites like that, Maybe you don't really want to do widgets, maybe instead just a plain old text link because again you're looking at load time issues. I still get emails from people that are running really old platforms that I don't really support, I don't really support the content on anymore. But the reason why they do that is because you know they're rural and they're accessing dial up, they're not on broadband. So right. uh, as as great as all the new stuff is, don't get don't get too fixated on dumping old stuff just because you've got the newest, hottest, latest thing, because people don't really upgrade the way you, you think they're going to. Yeah. So, but it's well, sometimes a good idea to just kind of link everything up together. <coughs> and if everything repoints back to itself. It's relatively easy both uh, to use the platform that's most comfortable for you, where it seems organically that it's happening, but also it does great things for you in the search engines for Google and stuff like that. Right. So you know, if you've got your band name and you've got it everywhere, and, and you keep up above the new stuff, you redirect it to what you're comfortable with, and people will find it there. They're not going to obsess too much about, are you on Facebook or are you on Twitter? They're going to find you where you are. Yeah, I think, that, I think to answer both those last two comments, um, I saw a tweet the other day 
from the person who's doing so, all the social media marketing at WBUR, which is the NPR station in Boston, who said that he saw this huge increase of traffic coming to their site from people who had just pressed the like button, on the Facebook <coughs> like button on their, on, on their site, that they were seeing all this traffic coming to them because they had added that button. So that's actually not a widget. I mean, it is a widget, but it's a little bit of code that's living on your site that that's not gonna have a problem loading. But that's probably partly why a lot of people are doing it is that they're not having to worry about interfacing with the Facebook server. But that if somebody is on a site, I, I find myself doing this a lot. If I go to a site and it looks up somebody of interest, I'll say I like it in Facebook. I may not get past the homepage, but then it's in my stream in Facebook and I'll come across it as I go through. So um, I think people, that, that little like widget, which you start to see a lot, is, um, is probably a way of kind of doing both of those things at once. Um, so there's a couple more slides here, and this actually goes to email lists, which I think I'll go through, and then Joyce can come up and we can talk about it because she's the master of the email list. <laughs> um, I mean, it's funny, but depending on what circles you're in, people will say the email is dead, and I don't I think that's an overstatement, but I do think that an email list is still really powerful for a lot of people, but it's getting harder and harder generationally to reach people through email. They've done all these studies about people who are 25 and under only use email because they have to have it at work, and otherwise they don't use it at all, which I think is not, not surprising. I mean, everybody has, every generation has their own mode, but this is a, a list of items that she suggested for um, building up your list, and I think you could think of this as email or Twitter or Facebook, whatever it might be, but really, how do you manage the people who are your audience and your potential audience by having uh, separate lists for family, for friends, for the audience, um, doing giveaways, doing some kind of raffles, doing things that are time sensitive, which I find works really well online. Um, you know, really looking at what, is, what, how do you incentivize people? How do you do something, first 10 people get in free, first, pe first 10 people at the show get a t-shirt. I mean, what, whatever it is, th these are old marketing tricks and tools that now anybody can do and has, uh, it's the, you know, the old equivalent of radio stations doing giveaways and calling being the 99th call kind of thing. But I think you, you need to think about how do you engage the audience, how do you, you give back occasionally, have it not just be about, I'm gonna constantly be pushing and promoting it, you know. I don't know what W-I-I-F-M means. What's in it for me? What's in it for me, oh, that's true, I like it. Um, and then she has URLs here, tinyurl.com, reverb, free drive, or, slash pledge free bribe. So if you want to check those out, so we can see if there's a file list that Chaya and Ariel will go back there those. for a second. Please. Yep. Sorry, it's <coughs> so reverb free bribe. And pledge free bribe after a tiny dot URL account. People still use tiny URL? Yeah, oh, I um, Bit Bitly, which is a URL shortener, is one of those companies that somebody's going to buy it very soon. But they actually, you can track how many people click on your link. So if you tweet something out with a Bitly URL, you can track it through your account on Bitly, which most of these other services don't do. But I always found really valuable. I was at um, Arts Boston, which is an art service organization, before my current gig, and it was fascinating to watch like what things I sent out would get clicked on, and, and people would click through, and you start to get a sense of what are the, what is my audience interested in, what do they find most valuable to them that they will clicking on those links. So to your point, it kind of tells you a little bit more about why are people interact with. Fanbridge is another one. Um, Newsletters, basically managing your email list. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, this is the same slide, but it's basically the variety of ways that you can do um, uh, audience management and and the kind of things that you charge in order to make money these days in the music business. So the idea of everything from a free MP3 that you give to somebody, which while I think a year ago that had a lot of value, I think is diminished in value because music is everywhere and it's so easy to find, so free MP3 doesn't have the same cachet that it used to. 
uh, a 99 cent download if you're on iTunes of the world or the like that you can give people a code to do that. You know, selling an album or have a package where it's an album and a concert or a series of concerts. Um, Two dollars a month club where an artist pushes a new song every week and, they, and the audience gets something new from them and they're doing it as sort of a subscription model. Um, Twenty to twenty-five dollars t-shirt hat, cooler merchandise. <coughs> and, uh, you're seeing this actually. Um, Topspin is doing this really well with their tiered packages, and I think it was Alejandro Escobedo's website is is just beautifully designed, and then he uses the Topspin widgets, and it's basically buy the album for five dollars and an MP3, buy the album vinyl and MP3 for twenty, <coughs> buy this this and that for a T-shirt for fifty or this, this, and this, and have dinner with him when he's in town for a thousand, whatever it might be. Um, Jill Sobule is here at the conference, and she's the queen of this, having done it. One of the people to do it first, of uh, sort of tiering these packages so that people are buying and donating and contributing to you and helping you to make a record, and in exchange getting different tiers of things from you as a result. Um, it's as old as the donor model is in the arts world for, for centuries, but now it's come come around again to the idea that you could sort of do this on a micro level. But um, yeah, top, top Spin is a really interesting one to look at because I think that's part of their mentality of how do you, how do you find the audience that the, the 300 people that bought the deluxe edition of the Nine Inch Nails package that sold out in two hours because that audience just loves everything that Trent Reznor does and he sold it for like, I don't know, $500 and then all the way down to people that just were gonna take it for free off the website, and he had a huge success with it. So he, he made more money with that promotion, apparently, than he had with all of his records before that. So I think, you have to be Trent Reznor, but still. Did you have a question? I think, I think what she was talking about was, was um, when you've got an email list, you, you sort of drill and trust, them. and you can start out broad, to make it easy for people, and yeah. um, only a smaller percent will then go on to the next Offer, that's right. And your offers keep getting more and more narrow, but you know, the revenue to you actually could be the same or more. Right. What do they what do they call it in the arts world? It's donor donor cultivation. cultivation, I think. Where you try to get somebody in for like a, a one show at a dance company or a theater company, and then you try to sell them the subscription package for the whole season. Then you try to move them over to becoming a donor, you know, a minor donor. Then you try to move them to a major donor. Then you may move them all up to being on the board. So not everybody is going to fit all the way through that funnel. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think she, I think she's kind of getting at all the different ways that you can monetize people. She talks about doing it uh, over time, so that you know, yeah. the first email that would be kind of easy. It's a say. It's a you know, we've all done it. It's been the case forever, but it's just now that we're doing it ourselves directly. So. <coughs> Uh, slide about iTunes, about selling music through <coughs> iTunes, uh, doing promotions where people can get a discount, and you know nobody's really cracked the uh, selling something directly for an artist. I think that's what Nimbit and Topspin are trying to do: is that they cut out and uh, TuneCore try to cut out a lot of the middlemen so that if somebody's buying something, they're getting as much of it as they can. The common problem and complaint about iTunes is that the model is the same as it was with the record labels, but they're not actually doing anything except hosting some files. Whereas the record labels were printing them and distributing them and promoting them, and they took their huge cut because they did that. Whereas iTunes, they just followed the other model. So I've, I've never, I mean, I buy stuff from iTunes occasionally, but I've never counseled our artists to sell through iTunes. Like, you know, you should be there because people are going to look for you there. But I actually would direct people to iTunes. I mean, CD Baby is CD Baby. Yeah, exactly. And they have the and best terms. And they've got a paper called uh, the Nonprofit. It's like it's called this year. It's last seven years in mind. Let, let us know what you think. Yeah, yeah. So, music success in nine weeks.com. Um, Ariel actually wrote a book that I read, which is, is a good primer on all of this. Um, if you want to come up and we'll talk to email us. And thanks for being you. So, hopefully, Ariel is feeling better. I'm sure she's in New York. She was in Nashville, according to the Twitter feed yesterday or the day before, so I'm not sure where she is. But, um, check out her site. She actually has a really good email newsletter that she sends out that. 
drills down into uh, really tangible, actionable items, which I think is what I find in the music realm as somebody who was a musician and works with a lot of musicians, that there's only so many hours in the day and you have to kind of figure out where you're going to spend your time and resources and really be targeted about it. So there's a handful of good newsletters that are out there and hers is definitely one of them and maybe we can get the guys at uh, Future News to post some of the others that are there. Um, the other item I was just going to mention, and the reason that I'm, I'm probably being harsh on MP3s is that um, I've become a fan of RDO, which is the uh, subscription service that the guys from Skype started, and there's Mog.com and GrooveSharp, and there's one other, but um, what I was going to say is I, I think iTunes is obviously a place that you want to be, but I also want to make sure that you have your songs in as many of those platforms as you can. Usually if you're distributing them through TuneCore and CD Baby, you are taking care of that, but I would double check and make sure your stuff is getting in there because I think once you use RDO or any of those other things, you're like, why the hell do I care about MP3s? You know, really. And, and uh, spoken like a music stop. Spoken like a true <laughs> music stop. The idea of like, well, my my uh, my laptop had 60 gigabytes of music on it, and it was just causing problems left to right. And then once these cloud services started coming along, I was like, that's it. That's it. What was the first one? RDO. R it's R D I O dot com. And then mog, M -O -G .com, is somehow related to MTV. Yeah. And um, Groove Sharp, who they may actually have somebody here over the next couple of days too. And they're, they're another service. They're basically, what they're doing is they're licensing. And I actually learned this by way of um, Anne, who used to be the exec director at Future Music a few weeks ago, because I was complaining that all these services were letting music play, but that what was the terms for musicians? What were they getting at it? You get paid. Well, I didn't realize that because I thought, oh, so these companies are licensing the music and then they're just monetizing the audience. But in fact, there is a unit cost for the company that they're paying musicians. So it's a licensing fee that they, the organizations, pay the uh, performance rights organizations. And the musicians actually make money from each play, which to me is a really interesting model. You know, completely opposite of payola music of you know, 40 years ago. Um, but uh, Anne was saying with a chat that we had on Facebook that the, the numbers that people are making from that sort of thing is, are actually becoming more sizable. I think when you have an audio on your iPhone and you can carry it around and plug it into your car and play whatever the hell you want, I mean, that's, that's a pretty wild experience. <laughs>